Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Age of Galaxy. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as we are playing it, and I will be showing a full game today where I play through the first and last round, and I fast forward through the middle bits. Now, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with great bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I am showing the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I will also put relevant corrections in a pinned comment below this video. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game, where each player is in control of their own galactic civilization that is made up of one to three different factions that are represented with these cards out here. Now, as we play through the game, we are going to take actions, and there are nine different actions to choose from. These will let us do things like research new technologies, either on our boards or on the various faction cards in front of us. We can also colonize planets as well as develop our colonized planets to get even more worth out of them. And we can use our military might with these ships to take over various planets from opponents or unoccupied planets that are out there in the galaxy. In addition to this, we can explore these random anomalies to gain various benefits. We can also trade in order to use our influence to get a variety of different benefits. And we can even nominate ourselves up onto the Galactic Congress to immediately gain extra prestige. In addition to all of those things, we can manufacture ships that we can use to protect our planets as well as to try and to take over other ones. We can also scavenge for extra money, and we can retrieve our various discoveries and turn them into relics that will be worth victory points at the end of the game. Now, obviously, I will describe the details of how all of these things work as we are playing, but those are the nine main actions that we will be using throughout the game. Now the game is going to take place over five rounds, and as we go deeper into the game, this token will move and we will reveal more of these galaxy cards, so there will be more anomalies to explore as well as planets to take over, colonize, and to develop. Now I did mention that each civilization will have between one and three main factions, and those will dictate what the major ideology is for that overall situation, and that will give the players different ways to get points for doing specific things in the game, as well as all the things that everyone gets points for once the game is over. Now after we finish that fifth round and add up all of these points, the player with the most victory points will be the winner. Well, it's now time for us to start playing the game, and we are going to play as the green player for this tutorial. Now, the game itself takes place over five rounds, and within each round, there are three to four steps, and we will go through those in order. The first step is production, and that is where players are going to gain money, as well as run any production abilities on the main faction cards that they have in front of them. In order to perform production, let's focus over here on our civilization, and the very first thing that we produce is three action cubes. We'll put those over here, and we will use these later on during this round. After that, we are going to gain money equal to the amount of the production value of our civilization, and money is this yellow token, and orange is the production. So we start off with a production of three, and we have one coin at the beginning of the game, so we add three to one, which brings us up to a money value of four, and we can track that by putting the yellow token over there onto the four spot. Now the reason we started with one coin is because this faction that we chose during setup shows that it begins the game with one money. After we have gained our money, we then must lower our production by one. So that means if we don't increase our production at all, then at the start of the second round of the game, we will gain two money instead of the three that we just gained now. Next up, we will run all production abilities on the main faction cards that are face up on top of our board. Now the production ability icon are those gears, so that means this faction that we started off with does have a production ability. That says that we can increase our money production by one for every two ships that we have, but unfortunately we start the game with just one. Once again, we can look over here and see that this faction that we chose during setup shows a one ship icon, which is why we start with one ship. So we don't have two ships, and that means this production ability will not actually generate anything for us, and we have now finished our production. In general, this can be done simultaneously, so we can see that both of our opponents will get their three action cubes. They will also both increase their money by three, so the yellow player will go from two up to five, and the red player will go from zero up to three. 
both of their productions will now go down. And the yellow player does have a production ability that says they get two money for every water planet that they currently control. But at the moment, they don't control any planets, so that does not get them anything. After production is done, we can then move into the second phase of the round where we will all take actions. Now, these actions will be taken in player order, and there are player order tokens in front of us. This is the first player token, so that means we get to go first, yellow will get to go second, and red will get to go third, and then we'll wrap back around and we will get to go again. Now that means we get to take the first action of the game, and every time we take an action, we will take one of the action cubes in our area and allocate it somewhere out in the middle of the table. So let's take our first action, and all nine of the action options are shown over here on this card. For our first action of the game, I think let's colonize. So what that means is we are going to have to spend money equal to the amount of planets that we have already colonized. And at the beginning of the game, we've colonized zero. So that means the first planet does not cost anything. Then we're going to take the cube that was our action cube and place it down onto a planet that we can reach and that we are adapted to. Let's focus down here and now figure out which of these planets are reachable. Now, as you may have noticed, there is a galactic fleet token over here, and any planet on the card that has this fleet token on it is going to be reachable, as well as any planet to the left of that token. That means right now, only these planets are reachable, but once this token moves forward, now all of these planets, as well as these behind it, are reachable. Now, you may have noticed that at the start of the game, only two of these cards are face up, and that's because all of these face down cards are never reachable. But the planets that are one card ahead of the Galactic Fleet can be reachable if players use the warp drive technology, which I will discuss soon. That means at the moment, only these planets are reachable, and now we have to figure out which planets we are adapted to in order to colonize them. Now, the adaptation options that we have show up on the main factions in front of us, and this one is adapted to the green leaf planets. That means at the moment, the only planet we are adapted to is this one up here, but we do have six other faction cards in our hand. Now, every single time we take an action, we can play one of these faction cards in one of three different ways. The first way is we can play it down as another main faction, and it's worth noting that as you play through the game, you can only ever have at most three main factions, and you can't get rid of these factions. So that means we effectively can place down two out of these six cards as main factions throughout the game, and we will be committing to those factions. The second thing that we can do when playing one of these cards is gain the one-time benefit that's printed down below near the adaptability, and you then get whatever that says and discard the card. So this one would get us three money, whereas that one right there would get us one ship. The third way that you can play a faction card is to change your major ideology, and I'll describe how that works later on in the tutorial. Now, I think what we should do is play this faction out because they are adapted to the red fire planets, and I would like to colonize here instead of over there. So we can place this in front of us, and we are now adapted to the green and red planets. Which means we have both of these as options, and now when we place this cube down, it's worth noting that the planet that we colonize must be empty before this colonization, so there can't be any other cubes or ships on that planet. Now we are going to go over here, and as soon as we do that, we can gain the colonization benefit for that planet. That shows up with the icons in the bottom right. This green planet would have given us one discovery, whereas the red planet will give us one production. Discoveries are certainly good, and I'll explain why later on, but for now, gaining more production seemed great. Remember, the production value that you have dictates the amount of money that you generate during production during the start of each of the game's five rounds. So, we've gone from two back up to three production value, and our action is now over. Now, you can only take one action per turn, which means that play will now go to the next player in order, and that is going to be the yellow player, and they have decided to take a research action. When we focus on the action card, you can see that a research action is going to cost three money or one discovery, and in addition to that, you might have to pay another discovery. Now, after they do that, they can place this cube down onto the technology of their choice, and they will have that for the rest of the game. Now, each player has the same nine technology options on their board, and then they might have other technology options they can research into showing up on their main factions. In particular, the yellow player does have a technology on this main faction, and you'll notice it shows that icon there within the technology, whereas these down here are empty. 
Now, if it shows that faded icon of a discovery in the background, that is when you must pay a discovery to go there in addition to paying three money or another discovery. That means in order to research this, that would cost three money and a discovery or two discoveries. Now, if we look down to the main technologies, you can see that the bottom six do not have that extra discovery cost. In addition to that, there are prerequisites to develop some of the technologies on these boards. Now, the bottom technologies can always be researched, and then there are arrows on these technologies to show what they are prerequisites for. That means right now the yellow player could research the terraforming, warp drive, or laser weapon technology if they wanted to. In this case, they've decided to research warp drive, and you'll notice this arrow points up towards hyperspace scanner. That means in the future when they do another research action, they now have the possibility of researching the hyperspace scanner because the warp drive is the prerequisite for that. And you'll notice that these arrows go up and then up or over. That means the prerequisite for the middle row is always the one directly below it, but the prerequisites for the top row could be at a diagonal. If you have terraforming and then advanced engineering, that is actually a good enough prerequisite to learn xenology instead of planetary shields if you want. In this case, yellow has decided to research warp drive, so they have to spend three money or they have to give up a discovery. And currently they don't have any of these, so they will pay three money, bringing them down to two. Now for the rest of the game, they will have this warp drive effect, and it says that they may travel one system ahead. What this means is that the card ahead of the Galactic Fleet token is now reachable for the yellow player because they have that warp drive technology. Well, that's finished up the yellow player's action, and this means the red player can now go. When we focus over here, the first thing that red wants to do is play a new main faction card, so they now have two out of their three main faction cards chosen for the game. After that, before they take a main action, they would like to perform this swarming free action. As you can see, that shows a lightning bolt, and on each player's turn, when they are taking actions, they can perform as many of these lightning bolt actions on their main factions as they want to. That means if they had the ability to, they could perform this one as well as that one as many times as they wanted to on this specific turn. When we focus in, we can see this new faction has a pirate free action, which says they could get rid of one of their ships, putting it back to the supply to immediately gain two money. And they've decided they're not going to do that right now. Instead, they are going to perform this swarming free action. Now that says they can spend two of their ships, sending them back to the supply in order to acquire one unprotected planet by ship, and then they can gain one money. Now, the way this works is they're going to take another one of their ships from their personal area, which means they have to spend three ships total for this action, and they are now going to acquire an unprotected planet. First up, in order to acquire a planet, it must be reachable, which means at the moment the red player can only acquire one of these planets because these are not reachable to them. Next up, they can acquire any unprotected planet, and if a planet is empty, it is by definition unprotected, and it's worth noting that you do not have to match up the adaptation of that planet to any of your main factions when you acquire it by ship. Now over here, we can see that we have a colony, and colonies do need to be protected. Now we currently have one ship in front of us, and if the number of ships in our area is equal to or greater than the number of colonies that we have out here on the board, then all of our colonies are protected, but if we had even one more colony than our ships, then all of them would be unprotected. Now it is worth noting that there are some technologies which add extra protection, and if a special technology offers protection, then that does not count towards the colonies that require ships to actually protect. So if we had five colonies, but two of them were protected by a special technology, then we would only need three ships to protect the other three. Now, at this moment, we have one colony and one ship, which means it is protected. So the only options for the red player to acquire are this green planet and that yellow planet there. In this case, they've decided to acquire this green planet by ship, so they can place their ship on top of it. And whenever you acquire by ship, you do not get the colonization bonus, because obviously they are not colonizing it. Now, it's also worth noting that every colony at the end of the game is worth one point. However, every acquired planet by ship is worth zero points unless that player has the red major ideology, which says that every planet acquired by ship is worth one point. By investing in this, I think it's likely that the red player will try to make this their major ideology, and I'll talk about the major ideologies in greater detail later on in the game. 
The final thing to note about protection is that a planet that is acquired by ship is always considered protected by that specific ship, so the red player never has to worry about anyone acquiring that planet away from them because it is permanently protected. So they have acquired an unprotected planet by ship, and now this swarming ability gives them a money. And then after that, we can see over here the skillful pillage effect of this other main faction says that whenever they acquire a planet by ship, they gain three more money. So that means they gain three money in this moment, bringing them all the way up to seven money. So Red has finished their swarming free action, and they haven't actually taken a main action yet, so they will now. Now, with this action, they could scavenge if they wanted to, and in fact, if they scavenged, they would gain an extra money from this hive-minded effect that came in from this main faction. The scavenge action is up here, and the way that works is you simply put the action cube down into this area and gain one money, but again, if the red player did that, they would get two money instead of one. Now, at the moment, they actually have seven money, so that's not the action they want to go with, and instead, they are going to colonize. We can see that they are currently adapted to water and sun planets, and only planets over here are reachable for the red player, so they are going to colonize this sun planet. Now that is going to give them a colonization bonus of one production, as well as one influence, and this was their very first colony, so before they placed that down they had zero, which means they have to pay zero money. Obviously they have one colony now, so in the future when they colonize, the next colony will cost one money, and their third colony will cost two, and so on as we continue to play through the game. So they can take an influence and a production, and the influence will come from the supply, which can then be put down into their area, and their production will bring them from two back up to three. Well, at this point red is done with a rather large turn, which means it's time for us to go again, and we have two more actions to take in this round. It's worth noting, if you have any action cubes in front of you, you must take an action with it. Now, I think let's explore, and the way this works is we have to spend one of our ships, and then we can put this action cube down into the anomaly area of this board. Now, you'll notice it does have a requirement that says we have to have at least one shield in order to do this, and of course, we do have to have a ship to spend back to the supply. We do have a ship to spend, and we also have a shield from this ultra-tough cruiser hull ability that came in with this main faction. The shield looks like that, and this is simply something that we have for the rest of the game. You never lose shields as you're playing, and you can gain more shields by developing the right-hand technologies over here, and there are also ways to gain more shields with various factions. This one right here says if you develop that cloaking cruiser technology, you gain one shield, and immediately all rivals lose up to two of their ships, which could be pretty painful. So we can explore by spending this ship, and then the way this works is we can take any anomaly that is reachable and flip it over and take any benefits shown on it. Currently, only anomalies on this spot are reachable to us, and anomalies are these tokens. So this is the one that we can explore, we can flip it over, and that says we will get three money as well as two discoveries. When we focus over here, you can see that there are three different types of anomalies that we could find. One provides a relic and two discoveries. One is like this with three money and two discoveries, and the last one is just four discoveries. So we can place our two discoveries over there and increase our money by three, bringing us up to seven, and that has finished our turn. This means it's time for yellow to go, and they are going to colonize. And they currently don't have any colonies, which means they have to spend zero money to do this. Now, they are adapted to water planets, and they can get to any of these planets or those over there because they invested in the warp drive technology, which makes all of the planets one ahead of the fleet token reachable. That's good for them because there is just one water planet and it is out here, which is probably why they invested in the warp drive technology. So they are going to colonize this and then as a colonization benefit, they will gain one influence from the supply. Yellow is done, which means red can go and they would like to do a research action and they are going to research laser weapon, which is going to increase their shields from zero up to one. Now that is going to cost them one discovery or three money, and they don't have any discoveries to spend, and they have lots of money, so they will spend the money, bringing them down to four, and they now have that one shield for the rest of the game. With red done, we can now take our final action of the round, and I think we should develop the planet that we already colonized. The way this works is we have to spend seven money, and then we will place this cube on top of the single cube on one of our colonies. 
we will then gain one prestige, and we will also either gain one influence or a money and a production. So we have to spend seven money, although in our case we have this industrialist effect from that main faction, which says we spend one less money when we develop, so instead of spending seven, we spend six, which leaves us with one money left over. Now we can develop by putting this cube on top of the other one, so that is a developed planet, and you cannot develop a planet a second time. It's also worth noting at the end of the game, every developed planet is worth two victory points instead of the one victory point for the simply colonized planets. Next up, we can gain one prestige, which is tracked over here, and we will do that by moving our token forward once. If there were any other player cubes on that spot already, we would stack on top of them, and that's important because this is going to be used to dictate the player order for the next round, and I'll talk about how that works later on. Next up, we can take a money as well as a production or one influence, and I think let's take the influence. Influence can be used in a couple of different ways that I'll talk about later on in the game, and it's certainly a good thing to have. So our develop action is done, although before we finish our turn, I think let's play one faction card and let's discard it for its immediate effect. This one will get us one ship, and that is important because currently we have the one colony that is developed, and if we don't have any ships, then it will stay unprotected, and it's possible that the red player could get more ships and then use their swarming ability to take that away from us, and we've invested quite a bit into that planet to lose it now. So we have now gained this ship, and we can lose this card, although before we do that, I'd like to point out some of the other effects on this card that we would have gained if we had used this as a main faction instead. First of all, you see that arrow with a line? That is something that happens immediately when this becomes a main faction. So this surprise strike says that we would have been able to immediately acquire one unprotected planet with a ship, which certainly could have been nice. In addition to that, we would have had the possibility of researching cloaking cruisers, which increases our shield by one and would immediately cause all of our rivals to lose up to two of their ships. All right, our turn is done, which means yellow can go. And they have decided to do a trade action, which is going to depend on the type of trade they decide to do. Up above, we can see there are three different trade cards, and we randomly chose these at the start of the game. Over here, this is interstellar goods trading, and if that is what they choose, then they can spend one of their influence to gain five money, or they could spend seven money immediately to gain two prestige. Instead of going there, they could trade with the mercenary contract, that lets them get rid of one influence to gain two ships, or they could get rid of three ships to gain two prestige. And over here, the other option is the industrial union, which lets them get rid of one influence to get two production, or they could get rid of three production to gain two prestige. Now, I mentioned that prestige has to do with turn order, but each prestige is also worth one victory point at the end of the game, and is certainly a good thing to have. At the moment, the yellow player has one influence, and they have decided to spend that, and they are going to use it to trade with the Industrial Union in order to increase their production by two. So they go from two up to four. And I would like to briefly point out that when playing a three-player game, we've taken a cube from the fourth player, and we put it onto this four-plus player spot, so there are less spots to trade with each of these locations when you are playing in a three-player game. And if it was a two-player game, then you would also block that spot off as well. Once every one of these spots are full, this card will flip over, and the benefits for that specific trade will be significantly reduced. Well, yellow is done, which means the red player can go, and this is going to be the final action of the round. With this in mind, let's focus over here on the action board, where there are still three different actions that we haven't talked about just yet. Over here, Manufacturer says you can place this action cube into that spot, and then spend two money as many times as you want to gain one ship for each of those exchanges. So that means you could go here and spend six money to gain three ships from the supply, but it's worth noting that players can only have at most five ships in their personal area at any one point in time. Currently, the red player has four money, so they could do this and get two ships. However, players are going to lose ships in the end of each round, depending on the amount of shields they have. And with that in mind, they've decided not to make ships, and I'll talk about how these are lost very soon. The next action option we haven't talked about just yet is Retrieve. That says you put the cube over here, and then you can pay three money in order to upgrade one of your discoveries into a relic. 
Now, you can't spend relics for your technology, as we saw before, but every relic is worth one victory point at the end of the game, whereas discoveries are not worth anything. And when you perform the retrieve action, you can spend three money as many times as you want to to flip over discoveries for each of those three money spent. The final action of the game is nominate, and in order to do this, you have to spend three influence and as a requirement, you must have at least one developed world, which means there is a cube stacked on top of another cube by doing the develop action. If both of these things are true, you can spend the three influence to then place this cube down onto the leftmost open spot and immediately gain the associated amount of prestige that is listed underneath it. So the earlier you nominate, the more prestige you get. And it's worth noting that depending on the player count, one or two of these spots may be blocked by a non-player cube. At the moment, Red does not have any developed planets, and they don't have enough influence, so that is certainly not an option for them. Instead, they've decided to research, and they will spend three money in order to research terraforming. Now that is going to increase their production once, and it says they may now colonize barren planets. Those look like this purple planet over here, and terraforming is the only way that players can colonize these planets. Of course, Red does have to spend three money for that research action, and they now have the prerequisite done for advanced engineering later on in the game, which would increase their production by one and reduce their cost for developing their planets by two money. Well, Red is done, and at this point, no players have any action cubes in front of them, and it is worth noting that there are ways for players to have more action cubes than other players, and I'll talk about how that could happen soon. Now, once the action phase is done, we would normally move into the war phase. However, in the first round of the game, you skip the war phase entirely, but you then perform the war phase during the second, third, fourth, and fifth rounds of the game. Now, I am going to explain how the war phase works right now, even though we aren't actually going to perform it. And what we do in this moment is we count up the number of ships that each player has at this point in their area. So if we were doing a war phase in this moment, yellow has no ships for zero, we have one and red has one, and if there is a tie between players, then the player with the most shields is going to break that tie. We have one and red does have one from this technology, so we are actually still tied. Now after we have counted up all of our ships and figured out the ties, we can look to this board. Depending on the player count, we will gain rewards. If there is a tie, then all players get that effect. In the first place spot, you get two money and one prestige. And in the second place spot, you get one prestige for a three-player game. Now, if one player had a distinct win by having the most ships, or if they're tied for ships by having the most shields, then they get the Overlord benefit, which means they get this, as well as the ability to take one of their ships and immediately acquire an unprotected world in the same way that we saw the red player do it with their swarming action down here, of course, minus the one money benefit that the swarming free action gave them. After that, all players have to count up their number of shields and their number of ships, and any excess ships to their shield value have to be discarded back to the supply. Now again, this only happens during the war phase, which does not actually happen in the first round of the game, so that means no one has to discard any ships in this moment. But if that was to happen, we have one ship and one shield, so we would be fine, and the red player also has one ship and one shield, so they would be fine. This means if they had done a manufacture action to pick up a couple other ships, they wouldn't actually have lost them in this first round because there is no war phase. But for the rest of the game, this is a big reason why you want to have shields so that you can keep your ships around from one round to the next. That's everything that you do in the war phase, which again, you ignore during the first out of five rounds in the game. After that, the final thing that we do in every round of the game is a galactic phase where we are going to move this fleet token forward once to the right, and then we will flip over and reveal the next card. Now, as you can see, some of these have some conditional spots. This says if this is a three or more player game, we have to put a random anomaly token down on top of it. So we can place this one right over here. And this also says if this is a three or more player game, we have to take a random planet from the stack and put it right over there. So in this case, that is a sun planet. Obviously, if this was a two-player game, then both of these would not have been placed down, and this card would just have those three planets on it. After this, we now have to take any cubes from these top three actions and place them onto these trade cards. Now, to better explain this, I'm going to put these cubes out here as an example. In this case, that means yellow and red both did a manufacture action, yellow did a retrieve, and we did a scavenge action. And in this moment of the galactic phase, we take these, and you can see there are arrows. 
from manufacturer. We're going to place these two onto the trade card that is over there on the farthest left spot. And we simply place them onto empty locations on that card. This one would point up. So it would go there. And this one points over there to the right. So that would go over there. So that means that these spots are filled in as players take trade actions, as well as by cubes when players take the manufacture, retrieve, and scavenge actions throughout the game. Now, if at this moment, all of the spots on one or more of these trade cards were full, we would then perform a golden age. For example, let's pretend we had a couple other cubes down on here. And in this moment, we then take all of the cubes from the cards that are full, and we then push them off to the side and flip over that trade card. We do the same thing for any of these other cards, and then we return these cubes back to the players, and up to three of the cubes taken from any of these cards will go into that player's active area as actions. That means in this moment, we would put these in front of us, and remember at the start of each round, there is a production phase where we get three action cubes. Well, we would have these two already, and we would add three to that, so that means we would actually take five actions in the next round, whereas the yellow player would take four, because that'd be three plus one, and red would also take four. Once again, if there were a bunch of cubes coming because multiple of these cards flipped over, you only keep a maximum of three of these as actions for the next round, so you can never have more than six action cubes at the start of any action phase of the game. The final thing to point out is that on the back of this, there is a worse trade option. You can go here as many times as you want to, and the cubes will be pushed up there from these spots, but there will never be another golden age that happens from this trade card. As you can see for this example, on the back, you can spend seven money to gain one prestige, or as before that, you could spend seven money to gain two prestige, or you could spend one influence to get five money. The final thing that we have to do in the galactic phase is change the turn order, and the player with the most prestige will go first, and if there is a tie between players, then the player with the token on top will break the tie in their favor. That means we will be the starting player, yellow will go second, and red will go third again. We already have these tokens in front of us, but of course, if that player order had changed, we would just swap these around to match up the prestige track at this point in the game, and after that, the galactic phase is over, and the round is over, and we can then move into the next round of the game. We once again start things off with a production phase. And over here, we have a production value of three. So we will add three to our money, bringing us to four. Then our production will go down. And we can look up here and see that we have two of these production abilities that show up on our main faction cards. Let's do this one first. It says Battleship Manufacturer. And it says we will gain one ship for every developed planet that we currently control. We do indeed have one developed planet, so we can gain one ship. And then the militarist effect over here says we will gain one production for every two ships that we have. We have two ships now, so that means our production will go back up to three. Because of this, we are certainly motivated to try and develop more planets out here because getting more ships for free is good, and those ships actually increase our production. Next up, the yellow player can produce. I just realized they accidentally pushed their yellow token forward instead of orange when they gained production. That is where they should be at. They are at four production, which they can add to their two money, which brings them up to six money. Their production will then go down, and then their aquatic crops production ability from their main faction will give them two money for every water planet they control. Now, it's worth noting that for effects like this, you do actually count planets that are acquired by ship, although at the moment, yellow just has one planet, and it is blue, and that means they get two more money, bringing them up to eight. Lastly, the red civilization will gain four money, and that finished all of their production. I suppose all of us should also produce three action cubes, which we can put in front of us. And now it's time for the next action phase of the game. Now, instead of showing you the details of that, I am going to fast forward through the next three rounds of the game, and we'll pick things back up again at the start of the fifth and final round of the game. All right, we are now at the start of the final round of the game, and the first thing that we have to do is production, and this can happen simultaneously, but we'll start by looking over here. We currently have six productions, so that is going to give us six more coins, bringing us up to 10, and then this goes down once, and up here we will now gain one ship for every developed planet that we have. As you can see, we have developed three times now, so we will gain three ships as part of this production. After that, we are going to gain one production for every two ships that we have, and we have four ships, so our production will go up twice. Finally, we can gain three actions for later on in this round. 
After that, we can see both of our opponents produce, but as you can see, they each already have two action cubes because there was one golden age that happened, and unfortunately, we did not get in on that at all. So both of our opponents will take two more actions than we will, which is not a great sign for us. And now when you trade with the Industrial Union, you will spend three production to gain one prestige. Well, yellow gets three actions, so they will have five in this round, and so will the red player. And then yellow will gain three money, bringing them up to three, and their production goes down. Now, they get two money for every water planet they currently control. And it looks like that is one, two, three water planets. It's actually all of the water planets that showed up in this game. So they will get six more money, which brings them up to nine. Lastly, the red player is going to gain two money, bringing them up to the max of 12. The production will then go down once, and that is it for their production. We can now move on to the action phase. We will go first, red will go second, and yellow will then go third. Now we have three actions available to us, and we have very discounted development. As you can see over here, we actually have a discount of one, two, three, four, five, six, which means the cost of seven development is just one for us. In addition to that, our cost for colonizing is reduced by three. But unfortunately, there are no more planets to colonize, and all of the planets that we have colonized are already developed. So that means we're going to have to do something different in this final round of the game. Now, one thing of note is the fact that no one has done a nominate action over here yet, and I think let's use our spot in turn order to make sure we get to do this first. That is going to cost three influence, and we currently have two, so let's spend this action researching. Now, we can research xenology because we have advanced engineering, and that is one of the prerequisites. And then we can spend three money or a discovery plus another discovery because of that icon behind it. So no matter what, we have to spend one discovery. And I figure let's hold on to this and spend three money. Now, after that, we will gain one prestige as well as a relic, which is worth one point at the end of the game, or two influence. I think let's take the two influence, which brings us over three so that we can do a nominate action later on in this round. And then, of course, we gain one prestige. So that will bring us up to eight. Next up, it's the red player's turn, and they are going to play their last card from their hand to simply take one discovery from the supply, and then this will be discarded. You can see if they had played this as a main faction, it would have given them the ability to research without any prerequisites, so they could have just jumped around, and that would have been a spot they could have researched to give them three discoveries and two prestige once. So they can add that one discovery to their area. For red's action, they've decided to develop, that is going to cost them 7 money, and they'll develop this planet here. They had 12 money, so that means they have 5 left over. And then they will gain 1 prestige, and they could take a money and a production, or an influence, and they'll go for the influence. Next up, yellow can go, and alongside their turn, they are going to discard this card in order to get 3 money. You'll notice if they played this as a main faction, that would have let them colonize water as well as sun planets, in addition to the green planets down here. And it says if they developed, they could spend one discovery to increase their production once and gain a relic. But of course, that's just if they play this out as a main faction. They are discarding this, though, for three money, which brings them back to their maximum of 12. After that, they've decided to develop. That's going to cost them seven money, bringing them down to five. And they'll develop over here. This will give them one prestige, and then they are also going to take one influence. We are next, and I think it's time for us to do a nominate action. This is going to cost three of our influence. And we do indeed have at least one developed planet, so that means we can do this action. We'll go over there, and that is going to get us four prestige. So we go from eight all the way up to twelve. Next up, the red player can go, and they are going to explore. This will cost them one of their ships, and they want to explore here. That will give them three money and two discoveries. So they go from five up to eight, and they have four discoveries total. Next up, yellow can go, and they would like to trade one of their influence in order to gain five money. So they will go from five up to ten. We are next, and this is unfortunately our final action of the game, while our opponents will have several more. And I think let's spend our seven money in order to trade it for prestige. We can do this by going over there. As you can see, seven money turns into two prestige, so that will bring us up to 14. 
Now, before we actually finish our turn, it's time to talk about major ideologies more, and we should play one of the cards from our hand. Now, there are five different ideologies in the game, and whichever one is your major ideology will affect what you get points for once the game is over. Now, a major ideology is one where you have a majority of that icon on your up to three main factions, and if you don't have a majority like this, then you don't actually have a major ideology, which means you get none of these points. Fortunately, the third option that you can do when playing one of these cards alongside an action is to use it to set your major ideology. As you can see, we currently have a tie on the board, so what that means is we can play one of these, and we will then tuck it behind the rest of these, nothing else on that card will matter, and that icon will dictate what our major ideology is, and that icon does not even have to match any of the other icons that we have in front of us. That means we can play any of these three to have that then become our major ideology, and we should do this now. With that in mind, let's take a look at the benefits. Now, this one over here is associated with the endgame scoring of one point for every developed planet that we have, and we currently have three developed planets, so if we make that our major ideology, this is worth three extra points. After that, there is this one. That will give us one point for every four prestige that we end the game, and it looks like we are ending the game with 14 prestige. That means if we divide 14 by 4 and round it down, we are looking at three points for that, which is actually the same as this major ideology here. Finally, there is this card in our hand, and that says at the end of the game, every two relics that we have will be worth one point, and we never picked up any relics in this game, so that one does not make sense at all. There are two others that we don't have as options for us because these are the only cards in our hand. If we had the red ideology at the end of the game, we would get one point for every planet that we control with a ship. And lastly, the blue ideology makes each research technology on our player boards and main factions worth one point each. Now, I think we've been building all game along towards a bunch of developments, so let's go with this one right over here. We can slide that behind, and that has now defined our major ideology. This does mean that we have two cards left over, and remember, you can only play one card alongside each of our actions. And I was kind of waiting till the end of our actions to explain all of these ideologies. So realistically, we would have played each of these with our previous actions, so I'm just going to cheat a little bit and say that we did indeed do that because we were planning all along on this turn to place this down, so that means we should technically have one more prestige and one more influence. Unfortunately, influence is not worth anything at the end of the game. But Prestige is, so that means we should have been up to 15 already. Well, the red player is next, and they are going to develop again. They will spend 7 money to do this. And they're going to develop over there. This will give them 1 Prestige, and then they will take 1 Influence. Well, it's time for Yellow to go, and they are going to research Xenology. That is going to cost them 1 of their Discoveries for that icon in the background, plus another Discovery or 3 money, and they will spend the 3 money. Now they will gain a prestige as well as two influence or one relic, and they've decided to go with the influence. So they go up to three total, and one prestige brings them up to three. It would now be time for our turn, but we are out of actions, so we pass, which means red can go, and they are going to nominate. They, of course, have to spend three influence, which they have, and they do indeed have at least one developed planet. In fact, they actually have three of them. So they can go over here, and that will give them three prestige, bringing them up to 11. After that, yellow can go, and they are also going to nominate. This is going to cost three of their influence. And they do have a single developed planet, which is enough to meet that prerequisite. So this is going to get them three prestige, bringing them up to six. Once again, we pass. And it's now time for the red player to go. They've decided to use this battle base matrix free action to get rid of one of their production to make one ship, and then immediately use their pirate ability to get rid of that ship to turn it into two money, and then for their final action, they will spend three of their money along with one of their discoveries to also research xenology. It looks like everyone did that in this game. Now they are going to take one relic as well as one prestige point. So that brings them up to 12. The yellow player is last, and they are going to discard this card that's going to give them three money, bringing them up to ten. We can see if they'd played this as a major faction card, it would have given them two production every time they developed on a barren planet, and it would have also given them a technology option of Ion Cannon, which added two shields. They obviously just got rid of this for three money, though, 
And now for their final action of the game, they are going to build ships. In fact, they are going to build five of them. They cost two money each, so they are going to spend their ten money. They can then place their cube over there and take five ships from the supply. Remember, you can never have more than five ships in your personal area at any point in time. At this point, all action cubes are used, which means we can now move into the war phase. And the first thing that we do is count up our ships. Yellow has five, which they just jumped into the lead with. We have four, and red has zero. That means yellow is the warlord. They are going to gain one prestige as well as two money. And then they can send one of their ships out and acquire an unprotected planet. Now, all of our planets are protected. We have three of them, and we have four of these ships. And in addition to that, we also researched planetary shields, which says that all of our developed planets are protected, whether or not we actually have ships to protect them. Now that means the yellow player is most likely going to take over a red planet. They obviously can't go after any of these that have red ships on it because those protect them automatically. But then over here, red does not have any ships, which means all of these planets are currently unprotected. So yellow is going to swoop in and take over this planet here, which is a bummer for the red player considering it had two cubes on it. That means it was developed and it would have been worth two points to them at the end of the game and it's now worth none. After that, we have the second place number of ships, so we still do get one prestige, which brings us up to 16. After that, we have to get rid of ships down to our shield level. Yellow has one shield, so they get rid of three ships. We have one shield, so we will get rid of three ships, and red does not have any ships to get rid of. The war phase is over, and since this is the fifth round of the game, that means the game has officially come to an end, and it's now time for us to count up our victory points. Now, we are going to get points for all of these things over here, as well as potential points for our major ideologies. The first thing is we get one point for every prestige that we have, and then we will all get one point for every planet that we have a single colony cube on, and two points for planets with a second cube, which means it is developed. So let's start things off with us. We have 16 prestige, and then we have two, four, six points for our three developed planets. We don't have any points for colonized planets because we developed all of ours, and then we don't have any relics, so we do not get any points for that. Finally, our major ideology was set with that card tucked in behind, and that gives us one point for every developed planet, which is going to give us three more points. This means we have a final score of 25. We can now move on to the yellow player. They have just six prestige over there, and then they have one, two, three, four colonized planets, so that is four points, and one developed planet for two more points. After that, they have six relics, so that is going to be worth six points to them, and then their major ideology is going to be this one here. The reason for that is because they have two of those green icons in front of them and one blue, so green is in the majority. Now that's going to give them one more point for every two relics they have, so that is three more points for them. This means they have a final score of 21, and now we can move on to the red player. They currently have uh, 12 prestige. In addition to that, they have one colonized planet, and then they have two developed planets, so that is five more points there. After that, they have a single relic for one point, and then their major ideology is definitely red. All three of the cards that they played were red. This gives them one point for every planet that they took control over with ships, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six more points for them. When they add all of that up, they have a final score of 24, which means we have just barely won with a score of 25. Red comes in second, and yellow comes in third, and that completes one full three-player game of Age of Galaxy. This also means the tutorial has now come to a close, and I hope that you enjoyed learning how to play the game. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.